Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Former Vice President Mike Pence speaks out on the Mar-a-Lago raid and a brewing court battle over unsealing the DOJ's affidavit. Trump's influence proves to have tremendous sway on Wyoming voters. Congresswoman Liz Cheney voted out, but a different story unfolds in Alaska. Two judges and the Kids for Cash scandal must pay enormous fines to their victims, one of the biggest judicial scandals in U.S. history. A group obtains COVID-19 vaccine test results on animal offspring, and their side effects on skeletal structures are raising concerns. A court overturns more than $200,000 in fines for a California church, which had defied government orders to close during the pandemic. What the pastor has to say. NBA superstar LeBron James has signed a two-year extension to stay in L.A. and sets another league record on the process. We'll detail how much it's worth. Former Vice President Mike Pence speaks out on the Mar-a-Lago raid and makes an appeal to the GOP. This as a court battle looms over unsealing the affidavit used to justify the FBI raid. NTD's Iris Tao has more. This unprecedented action does demand unprecedented transparency. Citing a politicization of the FBI, former Vice President Mike Pence joins the call for more transparency over the Mar-a-Lago raid. And in the wake of the four years that we endured with the politicization of the FBI, the American people have a right to know the basis for this. That said, Pence calls on Republicans not to criticize agents working for the Bureau. We can hold the Attorney General accountable for the decision that he made without attacking rank and file law enforcement personnel at the FBI. Pence's remark comes amid calls by some GOP lawmakers to defund the FBI. But other Republicans insist they're targeting its top leadership only. I think as a whole, the American public trusts our everyday rank and file FBI members. I do not trust the level of leadership that have politicized these great organizations of American justice. Trump, meanwhile, has compared the FBI and the Department of Justice to, quote, a common criminal, saying the agents, quote, grabbed everything in sight during the August 8th raid. He further accuses those he calls radical Democrats of using the two agencies to, quote, dirty up their opponents in elections. All of this as a court battle unfolds over a sealed affidavit the FBI used to justify the raid. Trump is urging for its release, but the DOJ opposes such calls, saying the document contains sensitive information about witnesses. A hearing will be held on Thursday on whether the sealed affidavit should come to light. Iris Tao, NTD News. And threats to law enforcement are rising on the web, as well as calls for civil war. That's according to a leaked bulletin obtained by Project Veritas. The Joint Intelligence Bulletin says online threats against law enforcement have spiked since the FBI raided former President Trump's Florida resort. One was a threat to place a so-called dirty bomb in front of the FBI's headquarters in Washington. Other threats were against people, including the judge who approved the search warrant for the raid on Trump's resort. The bulletin also noted the armed man who tried forcing his way into an FBI office in Ohio last week. The man reportedly wanted others to obtain weapons and kill federal law enforcement and said he was fighting in a civil war. The FBI didn't make a copy of the bulletin available, but said they're always concerned about threats against law enforcement. And in election news, Congresswoman Liz Cheney has lost the primary. And while Trump's influence went a long way in Wyoming, his endorsed candidates in Alaska have more work to do to claim victory. Here's NTD's Melina Weisscup with the details. Trump-endorsed Harriet Hageman prevailed in Wyoming's primaries by a large margin. Hageman won over 30 percent more votes than current Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Wyoming has spoken on behalf of everyone all across this great country who believes in the American dream, who believes in liberty, and who recognizes that our natural rights, the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, 
equal protection, and due process come from God. She's now up against Democrat candidate Lynette Grable. They'll compete for Wyoming's single seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. But she says she has bigger goals in mind. That I will do whatever it takes to ensure Donald Trump is never again anywhere near the Oval Office. And I mean it. The great and original champion of our party, Abraham Lincoln, was defeated in elections for the Senate and the House before he won the most important election of all. The defeated congresswoman is now considering a run for president in 2024. Trump commenting on her loss on Truth Social wrote, Now she can finally disappear into the depths of political oblivion, where I am sure she will be much happier than she is right now. Now, Congresswoman Liz Cheney is only one of two Republicans currently sitting on the January 6th Select Committee. Her and Congressman Adam Kinzinger, neither of which will be returning to Congress come next year. Now, what's interesting about last night's primaries with Cheney's loss, this now means that only two of the 10 Republicans who voted to impeach former President Donald Trump will be holding on to their House seats. That's Congressman Dan Newhouse and Congressman David Valadeo. The other Congress members are are leaving, four of which are retiring, the other four lost their primaries. Now, while Trump's endorsement is showing to hold ground in Wyoming, voters in Alaska are less convinced. Trump campaigned for Kelly Shabaka to replace Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski. Both candidates will move on to the midterms because of Alaska's unique ranked choice voting system. Murkowski won around 2,000 more votes than Trump endorsed candidate Shabaka. And so I hope that we do not become the party of one person. I hope that we do not become the party of Donald Trump. We need to be the party of those strong values. As for Alaska's single house seat, the Democrats are favored to win. Moving on to the November election is Democrat Mary Paltola, who's leading by a few percentage points over trump back candidate Sarah Palin. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And Rudy Giuliani testified before a special grand jury in Atlanta today. He spent six hours at the courthouse. It's part of a Georgia criminal probe into potential election crimes. Giuliani represented Trump during the 2020 election. He told reporters that he would not comment on the Georgia investigation until he knows more about it. Do you believe President Trump is the ultimate target of this investigation? I'm not going to comment on the grand jury investigation. What do you think their ultimate goal is I know here? more about it. What, what are you expecting to talk about here today? <laughs> well, they, they ask the questions and we'll see. Will you be cooperative? I mean, are you your attorney in New York? Grand jury testimony is closed to the public and press. Giuliani's lawyer, Robert Costello, told news outlets this week that Giuliani has become a target of the criminal probe into the 2020 election. Costello said that his client would not answer any questions that would violate attorney-client privilege. And two former Pennsylvania judges are ordered to pay over $200 million for one of the worst judicial scandals in U.S. history. They allegedly sent children to for-profit jails in exchange for kickbacks. U.S. District Judge Christopher Connor ordered two former judges, Mark Chivarella and Michael Conahan, to pay $206 million to nearly 300 people that they victimized. In what came to be known as the Kids for Cash scandal, the two judges shut down a county-run juvenile detention center and accepted illegal payments from the co-owner of two for-profit jails. Between 2003 and 2008, Chivarella presided over juvenile court and pushed a zero-tolerance policy. It guaranteed that large numbers of kids, some as young as eight, would be sent to the two facilities. Chivarella is currently serving a 28-year prison sentence in Kentucky, and Conahan is under home confinement. And a study shows that mRNA vaccines can have an impact on later generations. In a test by Moderna, some of the lab rats that got a COVID-19 vaccine gave birth to pups with deformed ribs. NTD's Jason Perry talks to a maternal fetal medicine physician to find out more. 
Judicial Watch, an organization that promotes government transparency and accountability, obtained reports from Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine trial on animals. During the study, female rats were given human doses or 100 micrograms of the mRNA vaccine, two before and two during pregnancy. The test results showed that about 4% of their offspring had statistically significant skeletal malformations, specifically abnormally wavy ribs. I spoke with Dr. J. James Thorpe, a maternal fetal medicine physician who is also board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. The most important thing here uh, to know is that these were formal reproductive toxicology reports from the pharmaceutical companies or the medical industrial complex. And the extremely important finding here is that they attempted, I would presume, in that they hid these findings from the American people. Although it is not known how the dose translates from rats to humans, Thorpe explained that side effects for pregnant women who take the COVID-19 vaccine is nothing new. He alluded to a paper that analyzes adverse reaction reports for Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. The paper was posted online by public health and medical professionals for transparency. So on page 12, 274 pregnant women exposed to this 75 of them experience serious adverse event in their own terms, serious. That's 75 out of 274. Uh, if my math is correct, that's 27%. And in addition, there were another 49 patients that had non-serious complications. So that brings you to a grand total of, uh, if my math is correct, 124 complications out of 274 patients that were administered the vaccine. Jason, that's not safe. That's deadly. That's a 45% complication rate. The CDC currently advises pregnant women to get the COVID-19 vaccine. We reached out to the CDC for comment, but did not hear back before airtime. Jason Perry, NTD News. And in a big win for religious freedom, a California church on Monday was relieved of fines it owed worth more than $200,000 for holding indoor services during the pandemic. The 6th District Court of Appeal found the order by a Santa Clara County Superior Court to be unconstitutional. Earlier today, I spoke with Calvary Chapel San Jose's pastor, Mike McClure, who's the senior pastor of the church, for his response. Pastor Mike McClure, welcome to our show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Now, your church had a big win this week. How does it feel to have those fines dropped? Well, I mean, it's nice for the country. I think of the First Amendment as something that is really at stake more than our church or me personally. It's really about what does America want to be going forward? And um, I'm thankful that we have a judicial system that sees what the founders saw, that really the First Amendment is something that should be first in the Bill of Rights, and that is um, that we have the freedom to worship together. And so I'm very thankful for that aspect and looking forward to, um, you know, what this is going to do for the church overall going forward. And so it's, uh, it's a blessing. And what's the feeling among your congregation? Well, these are people who were afraid to come to church for so many reasons, but the biggest reason wasn't from catching COVID, but it was from getting arrested or you know, just all the, uh, the fears of what actually they were threatened with, you know, whether directly or indirectly. But I think people are really blessed to know that we still have a country where they can worship God freely and the government's not taking the place of God uh, in, in, in their lives and their worship. So they're, I think they're very happy. You know, they're thankful. I get a lot of uh, text messages and phone calls and people that are relieved to know that hey, this is something that we, we still have the right to, to worship, to help people. To, to gather together, to do what the Bible tells us to do in Hebrews chapter 10, that we're not to forsake the gathering together of the saints as the manner of some, but we need to do it how much more as we see the day of, of Christ's return. So I think people are, are really needing church today uh, more than ever. And the gospel is what the world really needs, especially in America. You know, we've turned so far away from it. We don't know our own history. We don't know who Christ really is, what he came to do. And so I'm blessed that we get to present that and, and uh, gather together still. And as you mentioned, this case strikes at the core of religious freedom. 
In fact, it could have gone the other way, and plenty of other churches chose not to stay open during the pandemic. Why did you choose to stay open despite the fines piling up? Well, I mean, the three reasons, number one, is just because that's what a shepherd's supposed to do. As you look at our example, Christ is the, the great shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the one who gave his life for the sheep. And so he calls pastors, which are really shepherds, to do as he would do. And the church, you know, first and foremost, I think we stayed open because um, it, it's it's what God calls us to do in his scripture. That's what he says, that we're to, not to forsake the gathering together. Hebrews 10, as I mentioned, Acts chapter 2 says that they gathered together every day. They went house to house, the early church, and they continued in, in the apostles' doctrine, breaking bread, prayer, fellowship. And these are things that we see as really commands and examples that the early church did and that the, in this country that we've always done. So we have, you know, the biblical mandate. We also have, you know, our constitutional right, the First Amendment. And I think by just following those two, I've seen, you know, the, the results of so much fruit and you know, people have— come in here that their lives have been changed. I mean, people who were going to end their life, a lot of people who were on the verge of just total destruction and uh, their lives are utterly transformed. Not only are they they're saved, uh, some from ending their life, but they're they're truly saved in that, that being born again experience when you come into this relationship with your creator. And it's powerful. I get, I get a front row seat of just seeing, you know, life after life being transformed. We've had over 800 people baptized in the last several months. And, you know, the church is, is just ecstatic with, you know, not, not so much that we have rights in America, but they, they have citizenship in heaven. I mean, you can't, you can't put a price tag on that. Uh, and that's so worth opening. I just see the fruit. Now your church no longer has to pay the contempt of court fees, but the, your Santa Clara County is still pressing forward with its fees of almost $3 million, I believe. What are you gonna do? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not worried about it. It's like this is God's church. It's uh, it's His job uh, to take care of us, as He says He will. And um, you know, to me, if if we have to pay that to continue to to stay open, I don't see why we should. I think it's completely unconstitutional. So I honestly haven't even thought about it. I stopped thinking about what they say a long time ago. And I, I just think, like in court, you know, when the judge is asking me to do the things that they asked. And I said, you're asking me to choose between obeying God and man. And he knew that. He knew the scripture in Acts where Peter and John were asked the same thing. Is it better to obey God or man? You be the judge. And and that's a predicament he's putting Christians in, pastors in, churches in, you know, the government. And we need to stand up and just say, you don't have the right. You don't have the authority. And, you know, <laughs> I don't believe that we owe them anything. So to finish, do you have any message for other churches who may face similar fines? Yeah, it's worth it. You know, when you stand before God one day, you want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And, you know, we're all going to die. I mean, whether we die from COVID or whether we die from, you know, cancer, the reality is that we recognize that our life is, is really just a vapor, like the Bible says. And that's why Christ came. He came that he who knew no sin, the Bible says, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And when someone really understands that, like I told the judge, I'm not going to stop. You're just going to have to kill me. I mean, I, I, that's the reality. I think uh, my Christian brothers and sisters in China, many in our church, they're from uh, different countries, and they, they were the most outspoken, saying the things that they did in their countries to really manipulate the news, to, to control the fear. And we need to understand that, you know, it's not about safety, uh, which really is masquerading as, as, as tyranny. But it's really obeying God. It's doing what God wants because he's the one that we're going to stand before and he's the one who's going to reward us. All right. Thank you, Pastor Mike McClure. You're most welcome. Thank you. Up next, the Boston Children's Hospital comes under scrutiny. People allege that the hospital offers cross-sex surgeries on minors. And a state prosecutor in Florida sues Governor Ron DeSantis for suspending him. He says DeSantis abused his power. Stay tuned for more here on NTD News. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. 
cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. The Boston Children's Hospital is being scrutinized for allegedly performing cross-sex surgeries on minors. The hospital responds saying it's being threatened by far-right groups. Here's that story. A video from the Boston Children's Hospital went viral last week. In it, one of their doctors explains hysterectomies. A hysterectomy itself is the removal of the uterus, the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus, and the fallopian tubes, which are attached to the sides of the uterus. Some gender-affirming hysterectomies will also include the removal of the ovaries, but that's technically a separate procedure called a bilateral oophorectomy. The Children's Hospital says they've never performed hysterectomies on minors. There's a second procedure that came under scrutiny called vaginoplasty, where female genitals are constructed. The hospital's website now states that one must be at least 18 years old to receive that surgery. However, an archived version of the same site from April 9th shows that one has to be at least 17 years old for vaginoplasty. The video and archived pages went viral on Twitter. Users criticized the medical institution and accused them of performing those surgeries on minors. The hospital later issued this statement saying, Boston's Children's Hospital has been the target of a large volume of internet activity, phone calls, and harassing emails. The hospital has reportedly warned employees about threats from what they call far-right groups and is coordinating with law enforcement. NTD's reporter called the hospital to ask if they ever performed vaginoplasty on a minor, as their website used to indicate. A spokeswoman said they wouldn't discuss that topic. The reporter asked if it's the hospital's policy not to talk about sex-changing surgery. The spokeswoman refused to answer the question. Several counties in Kansas are recounting the votes on an abortion referendum that took place earlier this month. Two Republican activists in the state requested the recount. So there were 126,000 ballots that was cast on Election Day here in Johnson County. We're now taking a blue bin out at each polling site and sorting those into precinct order. And again, a polling site may have one, two, maybe up to 12 precincts of ballots at a polling site. Nine of the state's 105 counties are doing the recount, but it's very unlikely to change the outcome of the referendum on August 2nd. Voters in the nine counties cast roughly 59 percent of the ballots. And the ballot measure was rejected in the nine counties with a margin of 31 percentage points. The Kansas Secretary of State's office approved the recount. They say the two activists paid for the nearly $120,000 in expected costs from the recount. Kansas was the first state to vote on abortion since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June. The ballot measure asked voters if the state constitution should be amended to allow measures to limit access to abortion. It failed by 18 percentage points statewide. And in Florida, a Christian school is no longer required to follow the Biden administration's new transgender policy in order to receive funding for school lunches. That's after they took the Biden administration to court. Alliance Defending Freedom filed the lawsuit on behalf of Grant Park Christian Academy after the Title IX definition of sex and sex-based discrimination was changed. The administration added a transgender mandate. Under the new policy, participating schools must allow students to use bathrooms and locker rooms based on their gender identity. The academy agreed not to discriminate based on sex, but couldn't comply with the new mandate due to its religious beliefs. After the lawsuit was filed, the Biden administration granted the school's request for a religious exemption. And a former Florida state attorney is suing Governor Ron DeSantis. He says DeSantis abused his power by suspending him, but DeSantis says the lawyer wasn't doing his job. Here are the details. Former Florida State Attorney Andrew Warren was suspended by Governor Ron DeSantis earlier this month. He filed a federal lawsuit against DeSantis on Wednesday. DeSantis said he suspended Warren for neglect of duty after Warren pledged not to enforce laws restricting abortions and cross-sex surgeries for minors. 
Here's what Warren has to say. The governor has broken two laws. He's violated my First Amendment rights by retaliating against me for speaking out on abortion and transgender rights. And he's violated the Florida Constitution by removing me from office without any legal justification, throwing out the results of a fair and free election. Warren says he has never had a case on these issues come before him and that he simply exercised his right to speak out against them. He also calls the ban on abortion unconstitutional. Here's what the governor said about Warren when he suspended him. When you flagrantly violate your oath of office, when you make yourself above the law, uh, you have violated your duty, uh, you have neglected your duty, and you are displaying a lack of competence uh, to be able to perform those duties. Warren is asking for donations, saying we must fight back now against Ron DeSantis's abuse of power. The governor's office said they are not surprised that Warren would file a, quote, legally baseless lawsuit and that they look forward to responding in court. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. A new New York state law bans guns in sensitive locations. Locals in the Ad Adriandac Mountains are worried the law will infringe on their way of life. The sound of gunfire is nothing new in New York's Adirondack Mountains, where hunting is common. But many locals are worried their way of life will soon change. After the U.S. Supreme Court in June established a constitutional right to carry weapons in public, New York lawmakers created a long list of sensitive locations that turn many places into gun-free zones, including big chunks of the Adirondacks. Come September 1st, having any kind of firearm in newly restricted places like bars, concert venues, and also parks will be a felony. If the state law is interpreted as meaning a firearm can't be possessed on state land, I can't drive here. Hunting is a way of life for Rick Bennett, whose house is in the middle of Adirondack Park, which covers a fifth of New York's landmass. Bennett sells guns and fishing tackle from his store in North Creek. He has issue with private property becoming a restricted location if owners don't post signs saying guns are welcome. Because basically you're telling me I can't go anywhere unless there's a sign, unless everybody posts a sign that says handguns are welcome here, I can't go. I can't go to, to Stewart's for a cup of coffee. I can't stop at Tops for, for a pound of ground beef because without leaving a handgun at home. John Bow is president of a private shooting range in the area. You know, we hunt, we fish, we trap, we recreate up here, you know, and um, we have, a, luckily, fortunately, a lot of public land to do that. This will significantly reduce, if not eliminate, some of that access. Hunting will still be allowed under the law, but some of the other things that you might do, uh, carry a pistol for trapping. Is that exempted? Um, are you, can you carry a pistol legally outside of your home? It's highly questionable with this new law. Democratic lawmakers wanted to make sure concealed weapons could not be carried in crowded areas like Times Square or the New York City subway. But gun advocates upstate say Manhattan and the Adirondacks are not the same. The week after the law passed, the Office of Democratic Governor Kathy Hochul said state-owned forest preserve land in the park should not be considered sensitive locations, contradicting the bill's sponsors. And county clerks involved in the gun license system say the law is confusing, which does little to ease the minds of residents like Rick Bennett. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, high prices have many Americans pawning and even selling their personal items to make some extra money. And NBA superstar LeBron James has signed a two-year extension to stay in L.A. and sets another league record in the process. NTD's Dave Martin has the details on how much it's worth after the break. I'm so blessed to have been given the opportunity to take a refuge in America. After serving the army for 27 years, I retired to fight for our issues. Now I face a new battle, a battle to fix the injustices that plague our people. I will protect everyone's right 
lay the joint to forth a better future for all Americans. I'm Yan Shaw. I'm running for Congress NY10. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. Welcome to RenBiz.com, the education and career program where parents rule. We replace public schools and universities. We are for ages 6 to 100. Never any big student loans with us. You graduate with a traditional diploma, a university degree, and your own family business. Adults returning to obtain better careers. Parents looking for better academic and career opportunities for their kids. At Business Acation, you spend 50% of your time on traditional education and 50% on business education, including setting up your own family business. Learning is in your small in-person pods of six to 10 students. At Renaissance Business Acation, AKA RenBiz.com, graduation means you have a degree and your own family business. Like education always should have been, a transition to getting a career. Welcome back. It looks like many Americans are keeping close watch on their wallets. Retail sales in July were flat compared to the month before, according to a Wednesday report from the U.S. Census Bureau. This also marks a slowdown from June when retail sales increased by just under 1 percent. Analysts say consumers are spending more on basic needs and less on discretionary items. And on a related note, Target says profits plunged 90 percent during the second quarter, well below expectations. Target relies more on discretionary items compared to Walmart, which beat profit estimates for the same quarter. And with prices skyrocketing for everyday essentials, not only are people starting to buy fewer things, some have turned to selling their personal items to make some extra cash. And T.D. Zhou has the story. Some people are turning to pawn shops and online stores like eBay to make some extra cash. I just sold my car. A quick flip to get some money into our bank account. If our customers coming in wanting to sell us items has increased. Bob Moulton is the owner of over 20 pawn shops in North Carolina, called National Pawn. Because of the inflation, that, that the gas is so high and maybe their rent is up or their power bill is up, and so we are seeing more people selling than buying as compared to about three months ago. And it hasn't been easy for Moulton either. He says salaries for his 200 workers have gone way up. A used television is worth what a used television is worth. I cannot increase my prices. Our payroll is up 16 percent year over year. We cannot pass those increases on to our customers. And likewise, when people bring us items, we have to be very competitive to pay for those items. We cannot just offer them less and expect them to sell them to us because there's so many other avenues. And one of those avenues is reselling your personal items online. I spoke to resale specialist Pinky Chong, who sold thousands of items online in the past decade. If you're going to resell items uh, from your own closet or from just things around the house, that alone would be enough inventory for, for anyone really to have quick flip to get some money into our bank accounts. Chong says it's easy to get started by using sites like eBay, Facebook Marketplace, and Poshmark. And reselling items is taking off outside the U.S. too. August Gowan in the United Kingdom just sold his car a month ago. Gowan says car insurance and gas were getting too expensive. I was able to put some money into savings, which makes me feel a bit more secure, and also put some money um, into my business um, to help me buy things like equipment. Gowan says for people who are buying, they're spending less than in the past. After trying to sell a school textbook for $30 online, Gowan ended up getting only $10 for it. You know, People are really struggling for money, so having to kind of lower your prices a little bit just so people are actually tempted into 
buying what you're putting online. Phil Zhou, NTD News. And in California, despite a push for green energy, the governor proposed a plan to keep the state's nuclear reactor open. He said it's in order to facilitate the transition to clean energy. But shutting down the plant altogether has met with bipartisan opposition. Governor Gavin Newsom proposed on Friday that California's last nuclear power plant at the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant continue running for up to 10 more years. His plan will keep the plant operational from anywhere until 2030 to 2035. Nuclear power will make up for gaps in the state's transition to more green energy. Diablo Canyon currently powers 9% of the state. Calls for closing the plant have mostly come from environmental groups, citing costs and potential natural disasters. But keeping Diablo Canyon open has received bipartisan support, attracting the backing of California Republicans and U.S. Department of Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm. Additionally, a joint Stanford-MIT study published last November showed that the plant would save the state billions of dollars if kept running until 2035. Newsom's announcement comes as he's pushed to make the state a model for green energy. Jim Phelps, a California utility expert, previously warned Epic TV of the state's pursuit of becoming green. He mentioned greenwashing. When states like California cannot produce enough green energy, they buy out-of-state brown energy and use legal loopholes to relabel it as green. Under the new proposal, one of Diablo Canyon's nuclear units would close in 2029 and the other as late as 2035. Daniel Hall, NTD News, California. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Lakers superstar LeBron James has agreed to a two-year $97 million contract extension to stay in LA, according to a report by ESPN. The 37-year-old also has a player option for the 2024-25 season. The extension includes a 15% trade kicker and makes him the highest earning player in NBA history at $532 million. The four-time MVP winner finished 10th in the voting this past year despite the Lakers missing the playoffs. James, who's won four NBA titles with three different teams, averaged 30 points a game to go along with eight rebounds and six assists. But he missed 26 games with various injuries as LA struggled to a 33-49 and record. Elsewhere in the league, the NBA announced yesterday they won't be scheduling any games on Election Day, November 8, in order to encourage fans to get out and vote. In addition, teams will be encouraged to inform fans of local election information in the weeks leading up to the November midterms. The move is largely unprecedented in sports, with the NHL scheduling 11 games on that day, with 8 coming on U.S. soil. I talked with Chuck Flint, who's a former U.S. Senate Chief of Staff and current president of Flint Consulting, about the announcement. Flint says it's a good thing to encourage people to vote, but that the NBA is picking and choosing situational ethics. They want to promote values on the one hand to go out and vote, but they don't want to promote values such as human rights when it comes to uh, their relationship with the Chinese Communist Party, which it, frankly may be our largest geopolitical enemy right now. Flint notes specifically that the league has a multi-billion dollar contract with China but doesn't seem particularly concerned about the human rights atrocities committed over there. The NBA was running training camps for, uh, I believe, Chinese basketball players in Xinjiang, where you've got a Uyghur genocide going on. Uh, thousands of uh, Uyghur Muslims are being killed and put in re-education camps. It's not exactly a secret. And, and I think that's what rubs people the wrong way. The NBA season will start on October 18th. In tennis news, Serena Williams lost in straight sets yesterday in the first round of the Western and Southern Open to 13th ranked Emma Raducanu in what could be the next to last tournament of her storied career. The 40-year-old Williams hinted last week in an Instagram post that the US Open might be her final tournament before retiring. Williams missed nearly a year with a leg injury before coming back for this year's Wimbledon. But she lost in her Wimbledon opener and then followed that up with a second round loss in the Canadian Open and now has a very uncharacteristic 1-3 record for 2022. Up next though is the US Open, a tournament she's won six times previously. That's all for your sports news today. 
Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And coming up, China's investments in Mexico are growing rapidly, and they're avoiding Trump's tariffs in the process. And the Dutch government is sticking to its plan to drastically reduce livestock even after months of farmers' protests. We hear from a Dutch opposition leader who says the forced buyouts of farms is getting close. That and more after the break. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. China has been avoiding former President Trump's tariffs by making things in Mexico instead. And it stepped up those efforts by 76 percent last year. NTD's Colin Fredrickson has that story. China is investing in Mexico in order to avoid U.S. tariffs, such as the 25 percent tariff former President Trump imposed on a wide variety of Chinese goods. We see them in, in the states of Nuevo León, Baja California, uh, Chihuahua, uh, Tamaulipas, all the northern border. Adrian Cisneros is the head of the Mexico office for law firm Harris Bricken. Cisneros says China is taking advantage of rules in the USMCA and Trans-Pacific Partnership trade agreements. We're going to have Mexican entities with Chinese capital, yes, but Mexican entities manufacturing Mexican products that can therefore benefit itself. China invested $606 million in Mexico in 2021, which is 76 percent higher than in 2020. China's investment so far play a, a, a minimal role. Enrique Dussel Peters is a professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Peters says Mexico is a top foreign direct investment recipient and that China China still invests far less than other countries. China's office has been investing mainly in the manufacturing sector, no? in auto parts, automobiles, telecommunications, electronics, uh, historically and also more recently. No? Peters says this is because Mexico has been specializing in these things for the past 20 to 25 years. A lot of this is in what we'd call strategic investments, infrastructure, communications, ports, these areas that will give control and leverage over the recipient nation. Fergus Hodgson is the director of Econ Americas, a research firm that focuses on the Americas. He says China isn't just after profit, it also has expansionist ambitions. The leverage is becoming more and more apparent with the, the Chinese or Communist Party regime ex asserting itself and having an impact on local politics, including having, let's say, trade zones within which they have a large degree of autonomy or, or jurisdiction. Over a thousand Chinese companies have invested in Mexico, and China has become its second largest import partner, behind only the U.S. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. Turning to the U.K., inflation surged to just over 10 percent last month, it's the highest level in 40 years. Julian Satterthwaite reports. Prices are surging even higher in the UK. The country's inflation rate jumped to 10.1% in July. That's above all economist forecasts and the fastest rate since February 1982. Surging energy prices were the main driver. They've jumped since the start of conflict in Ukraine. It all has the Bank of England predicting a long but shallow recession. Some economists see parallels with the 1970s. Back then, Britain also faced stubborn inflation, a cost of living crisis and mounting worker unrest. Older Britons still remember the period of power cuts and shortages. But historian Alwyn Turner says political memories aren't so long. I think our problem now is a lack of knowledge. We don't have anybody around in politics who can remember what it was like with inflation. Certainly not in office, and indeed many of them not at all, because you know, this, is, this is quite a young generation of politicians we have now. In the early 1970s, a Conservative government tried to boost growth, but instead stoked inflation. An energy crisis led to talk of limits on home heating. 
Now the contenders to replace Boris Johnson as Prime Minister face a similar dilemma. Liz Truss says tax cuts are the best way to help. Rival Rishi Sunak says right now that would only make inflation worse. One of the two will win the top job in September and get the chance to see if their remedy is the right one. And in the Netherlands, protests by farmers have been going on for about two months, but this hasn't convinced the government to modify its nitrogen policy. Time is running out for Dutch farmers, as many of them probably will have to shut down operations and sell their farms. NTD's David de Vivas had talked to a Dutch opposition leader who says this could have a dramatic impact on food security in Europe. Since June, Dutch farmers have been protesting against the government's plan to tackle nitrogen in the agricultural sector. The ruling coalition wants to cut nitrogen emissions in half and reduce livestock by one-third by 2030. Several farmers told us they don't have a choice but to close their operations and sell their farm to the government, including having to sign a paper saying they won't open a new one. According to Dutch opposition leader Thierry Baudet, the moment when authorities will reach out to farmers who did not comply with the government's policy is close. We're not yet at the stage where policemen are actually taking farmers out of their houses, but letters are being written with the terms and conditions of the expropriation. So it really, it is underway uh, in a very real sense. Several groups of farmers proposed alternative ways to cut nitrogen emissions, but the government has ignored their suggestions. The farmers protest tactics of blocking roads, dumping manure on motorways, or setting fires alongside roads didn't succeed in drawing the government's attention to their case. Bode says the farmers' pressure wasn't enough. We have seen um, lots of demonstrations. We've seen moments where farmers put uh, dirt or, or, or sand on traffic, uh, uh, on roads, on highways to, to block the traffic. Uh, we, so we have seen lots of uh, eruptions of um, moments where the media reported uh, how, how angry the farmers were. But we've not seen the farmers really putting their power to, to use and um, and creating a national strike. So I'm I'm very pessimistic still. I think these these plans are going to go through. I think the government is going to expropriate about 40 percent of all the farmers in the Netherlands. Similar policies aiming to cut nitrogen emissions in the agricultural sector have been implemented in Canada, Germany, and Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, a reduction in agricultural production which was compounded by a shortage in fuel and fertilizer, has pushed over 6 million people into food insecurity. Buddha says nitrogen policies are part of a global agenda, and a reduction in Dutch farmers' production will weigh heavily on Europe, as the Netherlands is the second biggest agricultural exporter in the world. The Netherlands is one of the largest food exporting countries in the world, Um, so that will definitely disrupt the global supply chains. But of course, um, what's happening in Ukraine is disrupting the global supply chains. What happened during COVID for two years has disrupted global supply chains. The climate agendas, uh, all of these policies, they, they come together in what can be called a perfect storm. And we're heading for it. And nobody can predict exactly when it will hit us, but it will hit us fast and it will hit us hard. He also says the hike in energy prices will eventually impact global food production and prices even more. David Vives, NTD News. Coming up, we explore an Italian-inspired castle in California. NTD's Eileen Ang hears why and how the owner built it. That and more when we return after this short break. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. 
I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you get one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and you get a second set absolutely free. Or my six piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or get my classic premium My Pillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com and use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all my pillow products. It's not every day that you come across a castle in California. But did you know there's one in world-renowned Napa Valley? NTD's Eileen Ang hears the story of this castle from the owner who built it. A 13th century Tuscan-inspired castle sits on a hill in Calistoga, California. It's called Castello di Amorosa, or the Castle of Love. And the owner, Dario Satui, put a lot of heart into building it. First, you'll have a drawbridge, mm -hmm. and it really works. And we have a mechanism upstairs wow. for um, taking up the drawbridge. And then the doors, all handmade, every nail, every spike, everything made over the open fire. Wow. And they weigh nearly a thousand pounds each. They're about eight, nine inches thick. And wow. um, we uh, brought them over from Italy. Satui is a fourth generation winery owner. He follows in the footsteps of his great-grandfather, who immigrated to San Francisco from Italy in 1882. Satui has always enjoyed old architecture, especially medieval and Renaissance architecture. Spanning three acres, the castle consists of nine levels, with five underground and four above. There are five towers and 107 distinctive rooms, 95 of which are used for winemaking. To keep it as authentic as possible, he built it using the techniques people would have used centuries ago. He had up to 17 people chisel the basalt stones by hand, and he used grout, a mixture of lime, sand, and water, to hold the stone and bricks together like people did in the Middle Ages. Castles evolved over time. So if you look at the walls of an, a European castle, you can often see the history. For instance, they ran out of stone, of uh, this type of stone, so we had to, because 50 years later, the stone was exhausted from this quarry. So they had to go to another quarry and find stone, and that's why the stone is different. One of his favorite rooms in the castle is the Great Hall. The frescoes on the walls provide a glimpse into the centuries-old Italian lifestyle. So here, the ruler would hold court he would adjudicate um, disputes. Um, he would try to impress and, and, and put fear into his neighbors because of his richness, his power. Here they would eat. Here they would have their festivities. Another favorite room is the 12,000 square foot grand barrel room, which is temperature adjusted to age wines. The ceiling is 14 feet tall and has 40 ribbed cross vaults. The Romans not only invented the brick, they invented the cross vault. The cross vault was meant to distribute the weight to the columns or to the walls so you could put weight up above the cross vault. Other features include the main tasting room, a deep well, an armory, and even a torture chamber. The knight's room, among others, serves as wine tasting rooms. <laughs> There is a farm on the side of the castle with goats, chickens, emus, and more. <laughs> what he's created and what he wanted to create was a sense of family, a sense of community, and uh, recreating what he experienced at his great-grandfather's winery in San Francisco. This year is also the castle's 15th anniversary since it opened to the public in 2007. Tours and wine tasting at the castle can be scheduled online. Eileen Ang, NTD News. Calistoga, California. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.